All right. Welcome to the STOA, everyone. Uh, let's see if I remember this intro. A uh, place where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA. And whoo, STOA survived the maybe the end of the STOA party. Uh, and we have lots and lots of cool and exciting uh, events lined up for um, the next two months. Um, and one of them is this one, the Coaches in Residence kind of relaunch series uh, kind of party that was originally framed as, uh, but one of the, the new coaches couldn't make it and she's going to be Skylar Brown, going to be onboarded in May. Um, but we are going to introduce a new coach uh, in a moment. But um, yeah, maybe I'll describe what the Coaches in Residence series is at the STOA in case those who uh, are just uh, hearing about it for the first time. It was an experiment that we did back in, I think it was February. Um, it was uh, Tyson Wagner, our flow guide, uh, AJ Bond, who's here with us today, uh, our shame educator, and myself, uh, the Daemon Whisperer. Uh, it was a one month, a uh, little bit over a one month experiment based in the gift economy, where the three of us were giving our gifts in the context of a coaching practice. Um, yeah, and it was great. Uh, we had a launch back in, uh, I think it was uh, February. Uh, and today, it's uh, starting up again, kind of uh, officially. Uh, and how it's going to work uh, today's session is that uh, AJ and I are just going to chat about the experience that we had as being uh, coaches in residence. And then we're going to introduce our new coach, uh, Nathan Vanderpool. Um, yes, so is, is my audio okay? Video, am I chopping out or? It's cool. Okay, cool. Um, so if everyone could just turn off their video for the first portion, except me and AJ, and then uh, we'll um, invite you back on. And we're here for about 60 to 75 minutes. And after an AJ and I talk, we're going to introduce our new coach, and then we're going to have some fun exercises to uh, uh, in the second half of today's session. Hello, Hawk. <laughs> um, AJ, uh, how's it going, my friend? I am stressed and anxious, but excited to be here, I'm trying to let that go away because it's unrelated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, are you excited uh, for doing another round of the coaches and residents? I am. I've been getting so much like satisfaction out of these sessions. I feel like I'm learning so like so much about what my message about shame really is from doing the sessions. And it's like, oh, actually, I kind of just have like one thing I really want to say. And that's what I focus on in each session. And, and perhaps, uh, and I'm just going to ask people to uh, have their videos off for this portion. Um, yeah, perhaps it might be good to you and I just briefly talk about what our practice is and then kind of how it evolved or the experience that you had for the the month or so of doing it. So what, what um, is a shame educator? Like aside from the sessions, just like in general, what am I as a shame educator? Yeah, yeah. It's um, something that I invented kind of inspired by sex educators based on me having a transformative life experience around shame that started in therapy, but then sort of spun off into this whole obsession that's been lasted for like six years now. And I just have had so much more pleasantness in my life since I kind of demystified what shame is. And then I noticed that the more I talked about it with people in my life, the more it kind of had a pleasant impact on them. So then I was like, okay, I wanna like have a career where I talk to people about shame in the hopes that it will afford them some of the pleasantness that I have been feeling and that seems to be transmissible. Like I'm noticing it kind of spreading. So I'm like, well, I'm not an expert on shame. That doesn't fit. And I'm not like a researcher. That's aside from like my own like life. So shame educator and that model just seemed to fit really well of like this. I like I, when, when schools exist again in Ontario, I would love to like go into schools and talk to teenagers about shame. And I would love to go into businesses and organizations and talk about shame in that setting and maybe even prisons and shame. Like I feel like there's just so many arenas where you could get some benefit from educating people about shame. So that's what I'm trying to do. 
Yeah, and you've been educating people uh, almost a year at the Stoa with the Shame Breakthrough Boot, boot Camp. Um, and you got a book coming out in August, I believe, uh, uh, on shame. And and I'm, I'm curious, like, how the practice, how'd you find it doing uh, a month or so of uh, talking to people, Stoa, in the Stoa Ecology, in, as a shame educator? I mean, it's it was actually less intimidating than doing Shame Breakthrough Bootcamp where I have like, you know, 15 people who I'm trying to communicate with and kind of like, like one of the big things that I'm noticing and I think um, Nathan will resonate with this a lot. Like my nervous system is a big part of what makes the sessions work. And when there's 15 people in a session, it's harder for my nervous system to kind of hold everyone. But when it's like me and another person, it's so important that I can get impacted by what they're going through and feel the discomfort and things come up in me and be like, that's okay. We can, we can be with this. And by like doing that, it has an impact on the, the client as well, where they're like, yeah, yeah, we, we can be with, like, we can do this. And so it's like been a lot of kind of like getting comfortable with other people's discomfort in a really intimate way and finding that that's actually like quite manageable with one person and sometimes challenging still, depending on what they bring up. But like, I feel like I've gone to the discomfort gym for the last couple of months and really like grown some discomfort muscles, which is sort of my whole goal. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm curious if uh, um, uh, I imagine the practice is being refined by kind of engaging with all these people. Yeah, I've probably said like the same thing about shame 40 times in slightly different ways. And each time I say it, I'm like, oh, that that's a good way to say it. Or sometimes I'll say it in a way where even I'm surprised. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to write that down because that is a much clearer, truer, simpler way to say what I really want to say um, than I was saying at the beginning, the first set session where I was sort of like, my words were like, well, so shame. So I'm really like kind of honing in on exactly like, what is it that I want to say? What is true? Mm -hmm. And I've been hearing good feedback because uh, it's kind of cool. This ecology of coaches, uh, Yumi and Tyson, uh, we have same similar people going uh, to each of us. And I'm actually recommending people to you like, okay, this is a good shame issue. Or maybe I recommend Tyson because it's a uh, um, uh, person wants to work on become more verbally fluent or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah and for my part uh i did it for really intensely i had like two sessions a day for the um or first phase and then starting up again and it was really fucking good uh just kind of plugging in to someone's worldview and so like i call myself the daemon whisperer that's just some jazzy thing uh, uh i just made up the term but uh it's a philosophical inquiry uh where we come and have a dialogue with someone about an issue could be a pain point but really something that's alive that they want to work through and then we engage in that kind of emergent conversation and it's been quite rewarding uh for me mm -hmm. and it, it does feel like just sinking into someone's reality tunnel and like kind of how you said you know explaining is i'm not explaining the same thing but it's just kind of like being sensitive to where the person is at and how you know to communicate in such a way where it lands yeah i imagine it must be quite vulnerable or perhaps more vulnerable for you in the sense that i i when i'm feeling nervous before a session or even during a session i'm like aj you know your shit like you have something that you know is valuable and true to say about shame and maybe it won't connect with them but for you, it's like, the, I, and I, you are kind of the master of comfort in the unknown, but it must, you know, like, you don't know what they're going to come at you with. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not nervous about that, though, but like, I, I love it. Uh, it's sort of like mm -hmm. uh, kind of going on a, a, a roller coaster ride with, you know, reality in a way. Um, but there is that sort of the pressure of, because I love having transformative talks. And so mm -hmm. I, I always want kind of like, a home run you know what i mean like i just yeah. i want to hit yeah. that even with my friends you know i go to like i just i just, oh, I just want to fuck it um and then there's that and sometimes it does happen or it feels like something really happened a lot of times that happens and sometimes you know it doesn't happen but it seems like benefit or value was added in the conversation uh and just kind of catching myself 
with that kind of that desire to hit a home run, just pause it. Like, that's not what this is about. You know, you can't kind of engineer that. Uh, that if you try, then you're not in service of what wants to emerge and what's most alive right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, but those moments where you perceive that you have hit that home run or that there has been some, something transformative or connective or insightful is uh, kind of an, a really powerful addictive feeling. So I can see why like we want to have that every session. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so yeah, let's uh, introduce the new coach right now. Uh, and you know, this new coach is a coach in residence thanks to you, uh, AJ, because you did. So let me just introduce uh, uh, the coach first, uh, formerly uh, Nathan Vanderpool. Uh, he's, uh, I originally discovered Nathan in, um, he was working with Joe Edelman in human systems. Uh, and, and Nathan has a background in psychology and kind of cultural studies. He has a PhD in sociology. Uh, he's a singer songwriter, which we'll, we'll touch on in a moment. And he's the author of the social arts handbook. Um, and so I knew Nathan from human systems. That's when I originally met him uh, a couple of years ago when I took their course. And then AJ tweeted out something like, I was just reborn. How was your day? I'm like, what? <laughs> AJ reborn? This is, this is an event right here. And so then I looked into it and, a, and he told me, I think it was Nathan Vanderpool that did this for you. And I was surprised because I'm like, Nathan does this type of stuff. And the stuff that he was doing was called trauma mapping. Um, so perhaps I'll pause there and maybe it'd be good that you can kind of just talk about how you got onboarded to Nathan and maybe you can talk about your experience and then I can talk about my experience with him because both AJ and I uh, went to him and had a, had a session with him, the session that he's going to be offering uh, here at the STOA. Yeah, I just really randomly saw an interesting workshop title on another platform that I'm a part of and was like, oh, I'm, that sounds neat, I'll check it out. And then Nathan was there leading it and it was a really great session and afterwards he was like do you do a podcast called Discomfortable and I was like this is the first time someone who I do not know has heard of my like I feel like a celebrity all of a sudden and so I was like wow like we need to talk and we just like hung out and chatted and he told me about this trauma mapping thing that he had been creating and I was like I would love to pay you to do this to me even though we just met and it was a really transformative experience. Um, I, I wasn't even sure, like it had been so long since I had practiced biomotive, which is like sobbing in front of another human. So I was like, I don't know if this is even gonna work, Nathan. Like, I'm really kind of nervous. Like maybe we'll just end up chatting the whole time. But then like very quickly, we found an issue that was really alive for me. And I was just like crying and we were, going deeper and deeper from that issue into like, what was a really, you know, triggering that from the past. And this whole like journey, I completely lost track of time and it became this kind of almost like imagistic, deeply emotional journey through a snaking issue in my life. And we just kept going further and further and further until we really got to what felt like, at least as far as I could go, perhaps even like a very, the, the kernel of it, which wasn't like an event, it was like a, a feeling or a metaphor. The, the way I felt about it was that it was like, we got to a metaphor that was in my child brain, that like the way my child brain was conceiving of an issue. And I just like sobbed it out and, and with Nathan's guidance, transformed it. And then he wrote a song about it. <laughs> I feel like that's a spoiler alert. I'm like, should, should we even say that? I know, that's, that's what I'm wondering, but I, I, yeah. Um. So it was just a very, very powerful, very skillfully guided, very, very, very transformative experience in which I perceived myself in a kind of um, lucid dream state, literally like crawling out of a grave and being reborn as a like, adult man child kind of like this this like heroic self-liberating moment mm. that I now like carry with me and I sing the song um all the time when I need to kind of be reconnected with that sense of liberation that 
my brain has now found around this difficult issue. Right, right. And uh, like, I don't, like you said, I, I don't really do much. Um, I don't experiment with these things. I don't like go out to like for people, but like if AJ says something, AJ is like a kind of a junkie in this stuff. If he says something that like, you know, got him to reborn, I'm going to try it out. Um, and so I don't usually do it, but I tried out Nathan just as, as a kind of a whim. And then kind of like your experience, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and then he, he, my wording is that uh, he, you know, he, he located something that was existentially salient, uh, like kind of an issue if someone says something that kind of triggered me or whatever. And then sort of in the a mixture of like the imaginal and the felt sense realm, we just kind of like unfolded all this interesting stuff. And it got to a point where it's like, okay, it felt like we arrived someplace, uh, like this is the issue right here. And then did some work and Nathan will kind of explain his format a little better. I'm just explaining my experience of it. And then we did some work and then it's just like a beautiful moment happened. And then it's like some affirmations started arising. Or I started saying things and I saw Nathan writing it down. And I didn't talk about your experience before I had mine. So I had no idea what was going to happen. So after he started writing these things down, the guy takes out a fucking guitar and he starts playing music and he starts saying my affirmations. And then when he was doing it, it was like this, like kind of like my body was like, a, whoosh, just energy was flowing through it. And I'm like, what? It was, it was really beautiful. We started singing together. Um, and then after the session, uh, Nathan sent uh, like a recording of the song. Uh, so I'll play the, uh, the first kind of like 10 seconds of my, my song that, uh, Nathan uh, played for me just so you get an idea and I got Nathan's approval for playing this so this is uh, the song Nathan sent me after it's a mantra of my words on kind of the the, the song that he wrote on the spot let go you don't need an answer timelessness is on your side let go you don't need an answer timelessness is on And then uh, that that those three kind of sentences is repeat over and over again for about like I don't know was it seven minutes, and Nathan recommended uh, myself and Camila actually to just kind of like play it at night, listen to it, and then sing it out loud, uh, and it did have a, a really profound effect. It opened up, unlocked a lot of a lot of stuff. Um, and it seems like UAJ are still using the affirmation, uh, the mantra. Uh, oh today. yeah, all the time yeah so that's uh that's cool so that's kind of like our experience in a nutshell i don't know if it does justice to what the practice actually is so that's why we have nathan here he's going to give a little presentation on it uh, for about 10 minutes but aj anything else we think we would be good to set it up i think there's like a one really beautiful piece at the end which was that nathan encouraged me to sing it with other people so it wasn't just this beautiful transformative experience with Nathan. It like is a kind of a contagious um, connective social thing. So there's like, there's like a kind of a movement that you could associate with this. Right. And I see people saying like, wow, I love it in the, in the chat. And then it's like this right here, this weird thing that we just described, it's so stoa, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is like, I like, I want this kind of energy uh, at the, uh, as one of our coaches here. So that's why I invited uh, Nathan and he was happy to uh, accept. So without further ado, let's uh, invite uh, Nathan uh, and everyone can just turn on their camera now because uh, uh, we're going to go into uh, the presentation mode. Um, so Nathan, uh, how do you feel us gushing about you? Oh. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, wow. That was, um, thank you guys. I'm nearly on the verge of tears. That just like, um, to feel, I, I know, I mean, I've, I've heard for people that it's very meaningful what I'm doing. And when I, when I hear it though, every time it's just like, this is, um, yeah, it means a lot to me too. Like it's, I, and, and just remembering these experiences that I had with you two, like as individuals, um, 
it's always quite a, quite a journey for me. I'm like there and I'm just holding space, but um, going along with this is, is also like just such a beautiful process that I'm, I'm very, I feel very lucky to be able to do that with you guys. Beautiful, beautiful. And yeah, I think uh, AJ and I both think you got something special here uh, and very happy for, for the STOA family to uh, find more about it. So, you know, the STOA is yours, my friend. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I thought I would just give like, I mean, there, there's sort of there, you might've already heard a little bit of uh, what it's like. And so what I wanted to do is just show you a little bit or give a little presentation about what is behind it a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna like flip on this shared screen share. Um, maybe you guys can tell me if you see that, okay. Is that visible? Yeah, okay, cool. So um, yeah, essentially what I'm doing is trying to work with uh, the idea of people getting ungrounded. Um, there's, um, we can talk about that in a second. We'll go into like what exactly it is, but what happens here, I have this little, um, Daniel Goldman talks about uh, an amygdala hijack. So um, here you have like the prefrontal cortex on the left and the amygdala on the right. These are just different parts of the brain and it's neuroscientifically not this clean, but just as to make it a bit understandable. Um, the prefrontal cortex is the place in which we can analyze and make sense. It's where it's sort of stories, narratives about what's happening right now, where we, where we can think philosophically and reflect and all of these things. This is where we actually sort of um, in, the, in the most basic way differ from a lot of other animals or all other animals essentially, in that we have this ability to reflect on our own consciousness. And the amygdala is uh, a sort of emotional center in which uh, especially threats uh, can, can take over, but essentially the sense of like how it feels to be here right now, um, what's it like? And then when a threat takes over, this is like that fight, flight, freeze or fawn response. It comes from there. Um, and what it does is essentially to just shut down the prefrontal cortex It narrows the things that I'm taking, paying attention to um, and trying to protect me uh, says like, get out of here or get ready to fight or, uh, you know, these kinds of different reactions that you might have. So I'm working with this, which is to say, if we were to talk about it in a, in a way that is just analyzing what's happening right now, like you could even understand like, yes, of course, that's not a problem, uh, but it would still feel very deeply like a problem and you would still encounter this um, sort of what I'm call what I call um, in the social arts handbook like becoming ungrounded. So just really quickly, like when to to just define the terms, like um, being grounded is what I call it when you're able to pay attention to what's meaningful. So to sort of being in flow would be another way to say it. Um, if any of you guys are Verveki fans, this is like the alignment of the nom nomological, normative, and narrative orders. Or for people who haven't seen Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Uh, it's being in touch with what's really going on right now, uh, what matters to me, and how I want to participate in what's happening. If I can track all of that and sort of have choice around that, then I'm grounded. Um, and sometimes the amygdala hijacks my ability to do that, and I perceive something that's like a false danger. So sometimes, if it's a real danger, I wouldn't call it being ungrounded. If there's an actual lion in front of you and you're freaked out, that's that's not ungrounded. Uh, but if I, uh, so if I perceive a false danger and enter into a threat response and my attention is going to narrow, so I'm not in flow, um, I lose track of what's really going on, what matters to me, how I want to participate and what's happening, um, these things sort of become unavailable to me. Um, yeah, so essentially what we're trying to do is like, just as one other thing, I guess, um, as being ungrounded, you often might not recognize it in the moment. Um, so you can train yourself through like meditation and reflection to see, oh, I'm ungrounded right now. And that's actually a very important skill to develop. But um, just if you were trying to define grounded in a little bit more of how is it usually experienced, often people will look back and be like, why did I act that way? Why did I say that thing? Why did I feel like it was so existential and so like I might die? Uh, when in the sort of cold light of day afterwards, when you're not in the situation, you, you would have wished that you would have uh, paid attention to something else that really mattered to you and participated in that 
that interaction in a different way. Um, so we just like take a little example, like uh, let's say that your boss at work is giving you some kind of uh, pitch on what you guys are going to do next as a team, and you think like this is really stupid. Uh, but what happens is instead of speaking up and saying that, uh, you get like this icy feeling in your face and maybe in your arms and you get like a tension here in your throat and you feel a bit nauseous and you don't say anything. Uh, and then maybe like later you're at home and you're eating dinner and you're just getting angry with yourself. Like, why didn't I speak up? This is like really good, such a waste of time. Um, this is the kind of situation in which somebody's ungrounded. Um, and through the research that I've done, I found essentially that's some kind of threat that's been stored in your amygdala, um, projecting itself into the situation, trying in a way to be very helpful <laughs> and protect you, uh, but ultimately a lot of times sort of misfiring and creating these, this inability to stay with what is, what matters to me and how I wanna participate. Um, so when that happens, um, we, I call this like the sense of activation and safety. What I do in the trauma mapping is we start with really going into the body. Like, where is this and how does it feel? And what's the state like? I wanna make sure that you could recognize it like you would recognize a person when they're walking down the street. Like that if this happens again, this body state, you'll know that's where it is and that's where we start. Um, so I use some research by uh, Ekman and Tatarian. I think that's how you say his name. I've never met Doug. Uh, and, and I'm really just like working with these things in a, in a sense behind the scenes, like I'm giving you a bit of a peek behind the curtain here when you would actually do trauma mapping and you wouldn't, you wouldn't talk about this. I would just kind of like guide you and be like working through these different stages as they're appropriate to what's going on in, in our conversation. Um, so we try to like sort of outline, really get you embodied, really imagine you're in this situation, um, and then we start to, I start to like identify what are the emotions, what's, what's the threat, where's this coming from? And then bring it back to, uh, well, Tatarian actually calls this uh, interpersonal feelings, but I call it a sense of us. So it might be like in this situation, it seems like you're ignoring me. So maybe you're having a fight with your uh, significant other and you, you feel like you're ignoring me and you get way out of proportion angry about what's happening right here. Um, chances are that there is some time in your past or also sometimes, I mean, we could talk about it if you guys want to in, in some Q&A later or something, but sometimes it could just come from sort of the culture, like uh, maybe some patriarchal structure has like in, informed you in a way that like, this is what it is, I'm being ignored uh, and it's a threat because it means that I, uh, it's going to trigger some sense that I'm not important, not valuable, not worth loving. Uh, a lot of different things can be at the root of this. And this is where we're gonna kind of dig back. Um, but again, if we were to sit here and analyze, what is it? We could even come up with some very plausible, maybe even the quote unquote right things. And it wouldn't really address this emotional structure that's in your amygdala that needs to be sort of reprogrammed and shown in some way, um, this isn't a threat. That looks like a snake, but it's actually a rope. And I'm, we're trying to like open that sense up. So what I do is going through the body, identifying in the situation, what is sort of happening here? How am I making sense of it? How am I, what do I think is going on? Um, then we sort of drop this, let's say a metaphorical dome around you and, and cut off all of those explanations and start to look in a couple of ways at your past and at your, uh, at your sense making. So here I outlined a couple of things that I use that are sort of, this is where it gets a bit complex because depending on the person, depending on the experience, depending on the way that they tend to make sense, like AJ and uh, Peter are quite different sense makers. Um, uh, and so this part just like, it has a, an incredibly different quality depending on who it is I'm working with. But the basic tools that I'm using would be focusing. You may know that from Gendlin's focusing. Um, basically like working with resonance, what, what feels resonant in the body. And we're still staying very embodied through this whole process because it's not, again, this prefrontal cortex uh, analytic uh, endeavor. It's, a, it's an emotional endeavor that's trying to go through the body and where is this stored in the body? Um, uh, with bioemotive here in the middle, we're, we're using this, uh, he calls it the nine core feelings, I call it the sense of self. 
um, we're like, I'm sort of tracking that. Sometimes I might have somebody speak these as you do in bioemotive, if you're familiar with that technique, um, depending on what's going on. And also the uh, imaginal, which um, for me as um, I'm a, a student of Buddhism, I'm starting to work with the monastic academy um, in a sort of peripheral way. I'm, I'm not representative of the Mas monastic academy, but um, Berbea, and I don't know if you guys know Daniel Thorsten, he was a student of uh, Berbea and um, through him, I've been coming into working with the imaginal, so archetypes, memories, colors, relations, these kinds of things that are basically the, the dream language, um, but we try to access it while you're awake. Again, going past this analytic side of our brains and really looking at like what is resonant, what's emotionally there, what's in my, what feels like my body, the felt sense of the moment, um, you can trace it sort of to the amygdala and the limbic system in a biological way, or you can just talk about this as the imaginal, um, those aspects of my felt sense of what's going on. Um, and we push through this oftentimes, um, or sometimes we won't come to a sob. Sometimes we come to sort of just a physical release where like there's, we suddenly emerge in a sense of calm. A lot of times we'll get to uh, sobbing where there's a deep crying. So not just a venting of like emotional energy, but like a snot running down your nose, like just falling apart kind of crying. Uh, and either way, we, we eventually end up in a place where that tension that underlies this ungroundedness is the trigger essentially, like the, the sort of the way that you've been making sense of there's something threatening here. Uh, gets that energy that, it, that it's pushing out there to say, hey, watch out, danger, danger, um, gets released. Uh, it's even happened that, I mean, people can like start laughing hysterically. That there's some way usually that this just like comes out of the body. Um, and at that point, we are in this new release tension body state. It's often very calm, peaceful. Uh, People experience it in different ways, and even the same person in different situations will experience it in a different way. But staying with this imaginal, um, I'll have you sort of go into that body state and get to know it as though it's a person, and then have this person speak to that previous person, the, the trauma, uh, the sort of the trauma response, the, the triggered person, the person who's got in this other body state, just speaking intuitively, like, what is it that you would say to this person to help them to find the way to hear. Um, essentially what we're doing is trying to create an anchor so that when you're in that trauma response state that you can actually like move yourself through this progression and say, okay, this is also available. This is also always here for me. Um, and then what I do is like by noting down some of the words um, that you are speaking in this intuitive way um, and then I make a mantra. So this is just based on mysticism. It's a very classic technique to, uh, to sort of anchor a certain mind state. Um, you sing, bypassing also prefrontal cortex. Um, so straight to the amygdala, you sing, and you, um, you sing over and over and over. So we sing this usually for like seven minutes. Um, here are some examples like, uh, relax, you are loved, you can love. Set the playground on fire. Or, uh, here you go, let go, you don't need an answer. Timelessness is on your side. You guys heard that one. Be, breathe, be brave, and trust yourself. Um, but I mean, it can be like, fuck you, this matters. That's, that was one. <laughs> so it's not always just, you know, some uh, gooey stuff. Like there's, it just really depends. Uh, uh, yeah, if you, AJ already shared his, this also on here, that you did it, you're reborn, enjoy being out of the grave. Um, yeah, I am the face of God. I am beautiful. I mean, sometimes these are just like, who I, I get even remit because they all remind me also of these experiences that I've had with people going through this and then coming out and like seeing this beautiful truth that it's not an analytic truth. You can see like looking at this, these are not some sort of like, you know, formulaic thing that's that points to something. It's just like this resonates very deeply with that experience. And then I have you sing that with me you sing it. I'd make a recording and send it to you and have you sing it every day for seven days. And also um, as both AJ and Peter described, it's very important uh, or just a very extra power boost to sing it with other people, look them in the eyes and sing this. And it establishes it as a sort of like interpersonal truth so that this fear, this threat um, can let go, can relax 
and we can just like anchor ourselves in this uh, new way of sense making that sees okay I don't have to be afraid of that uh, I don't need to be afraid when I feel like someone's ignoring me I'm, I'm not worthless um, I don't need to fear that anymore I can stay with myself I can stay with what's really going on I can stay with what matters to me and how I want to participate in the situation and maybe if somebody's ignoring me I'll just stop talking and walk away instead of going into this deep like sense of fear like I'm worthless and I'll be alone uh, just as an example but um, there's a wide range, but of course, like a bit of a limited range of uh, the kinds of things that these things happen. Uh, often they're, they're, they're very social because we're social creatures. Um, AJ, I'm sure, has, would have plenty to say about they're, they're mostly what you would call shame. Um, and so this is a way of working with that that goes deeply into the way that it, it sits in our bodies and we are, we've learned to respond to situations. Um, and trying to heal that. So we come through this experience together and we finish with the healing piece of art. Yeah, that's, that's essentially uh, what I do with trauma mapping. And I am very grateful to Peter for um, giving me the platform to sort of open up to the STOA, uh, the people on here, and I look forward to meeting you and working with everybody here. Um, and just trying to like, yeah, build this practice out and, and spread it. Cool. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing your screen. And Nathan, what do you think about this? Since we have about 20 minutes left, instead of doing the exercise that we thought of, which was kind of unrelated, um, it might be good to have some Q and A. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah? Let's do that, yeah, that's great. Cool. Um, so if you have any questions, put them uh, in the chat. I'll call on you, you can unmute yourself. If you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that. Um, AJ, I have a question for Nathan, but AJ, do you have any question uh, after seeing that? Well, I, what's coming up for me is that I wanted to note for everyone and for Nathan that since this event, I have been noticing different amygdala hijacks and noting them down and being like, this would be a good candidate for a trauma mapping session. Like, oh, every time, this happens, I go into this and it's like, hmm, I wonder, you know, we could probably root in and kind of open that up a bit. So it does seem like it just sort of not only helped me, but got me really noticing these hijacks in my life and just keeping track of them and being like, okay, well, I hope that I can open that one up at some point and that one and that one. So it's mm -hmm. sort of more of a comment, but um, that alone, that awareness of those hijacks is really helpful. And uh, yeah, I just had a basic question. Like, how did you like, like practice this or discover this? Like kind of put all the pieces together? Um, like, cause that music piece, especially like, like ooh, that's, that's original and, and different. Um, so I'm curious how you just kind of like pieced all this practice together. Yeah, it's, it's the result of a long circuitous path. Um, originally, as you said, I was working with Joe Edelman um, doing human systems. So if, if anybody on the show has ever done Social Design Club, um, I was sort of working with this, um, playing social game or seeing social, socializing as a social game, looking at how could we lower the difficulty of social games so people could stay grounded. Um, and then about three years ago, my attention really like shifted, my, my curiosity really shifted toward uh, how could we raise the ability of play, the players? So like, why is it that I, have trouble playing social games and how could I get better at that? Um, and in my research, I just started to like, I'm just sort of a pan curious autodidact and went, went kind of crazy as I do and nerded out on it for a long time. Um, but the essential thing that connects it to the human systems work is that it's about attention. And so, as I said, like I've been working a lot uh, with attention and I, I basically uh, started to do a deep dive on trauma healing. There are a lot of amazing methods that are already out there. Um, uh, the, mo the ones that I found, for example, most relevant to the kinds of things that were working for me were focusing and biomotive framework um, and this imaginal um, meditation through like Buddhist meditation. Uh, and so I was kind of just like working with this, putting it together practicing by playing um, with myself initially, then with like close friends, 
working on these kinds of uh, processes and seeing what what really helped, um, what what got people into that experience and what what happened afterwards. And um, eventually, I I had the experience of like, okay, we have this really transformational moment, and then it just seems to drift away over time. And somebody has like a real deep insight and and they can't quite hold on to it. And that um, in speaking with uh, some friends of mine, um, including my friend uh, Ronya Polsin, uh, it was this clear like, okay, why don't you do the same thing that spiritual traditions have done for thousands of years? <laughs> You're a songwriter, just like you can write a song off the top of your head, like just do that and then we'll sing it as a mantra. And this will be a way to remind ourselves, like to bring it through ourselves and, and train it in our bodies. Um, and so I just uh, tried it. And when we tried it, that was like when it clicked into place. And I thought, okay, now, now we actually have a practice because uh, to sing this and to create an anchor, I think potentially there are other ways, like other anchors, but to create the anchor. Um, so somebody might be a uh, visual artist and draw it and you could carry this little uh, image around with you to look at, or maybe there are other ways. This was just my artistic practice put here. But yeah, when we found the anchor idea of how can we like keep this transformational experience, transformative experience through time, um, that's when I felt like it finally kind of clicked into place. Very cool. Um, yeah, someone's saying a sigil. Uh, the, so if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I will read one that someone asked me to read on their behalf. And it's the first tough question, obviously. <laughs> Always the first one's a tough one. So either by the name of the technique, then from the description of the process, seems like the technique actively tries to work with trauma. Trauma is very delicate matter and requires very rooted capacity and skills to be touched. The ones of a licensed therapist. This seems to be dismissed and referring it to as coaching. Are you, Nathan, a therapist? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I mean, I have a degree in psychology. I have a lot of experience working with people in deeply emotional issues, and I'm not a therapist, and I don't claim to be a therapist. Uh, essentially, what I do is hold space for the other person. Like, I offer, I never offer any kind of advice. I also never push uh, when we're in a situation which we're exploring these kinds of things. I never try to get someone to like to, to go further than they feel capable of moving with me in that situation. Um, so it's a it's a point that I um, do sort of prominently announce and uh, and now before I would actually have a session would have someone sign a disclaimer because I'm not. A therapist. Um, so far, I've had no negative experiences with somebody doing this. Um, but I admit that it's, it's an issue that I try to pay particular attention to, to stay very much in touch with what's happening, to stay to, to check in with people after it's happened after we've done a session like this. Um, but essentially, I'm just like a very, I mean, the way to look at that would be like, I'm a sort of like, highly emotional, capable friend who wants to talk to you about, or you're talking to you about some things. That's about like the way that the sessions feel. Um, but yes, I'm not a licensed therapist and I don't pretend to be. And sometimes for some things, I mean, these are situations where we're just like working with being ungrounded. If you're experiencing like something like severe depression or some signs of schizophrenia, I would recommend that you, this is not the practice, like go see a therapist. Um, if you're experiencing something like, I can't, uh, I keep getting way out of proportion frustrated when I'm talking to my child. Uh, it might help, it has helped. So with those caveats, it's something, uh, it's an experimental practice and yeah. Yeah, and I think this is something um, that's probably gonna come up if this coaching thing continues at the STOA. And I know AJ and I have been talking about this and this is sort of that gray area between the coaching, the therapy uh, type thing. Um, and framing is really important up front. Uh, so if anyone has any suggestions listening to this or watching this on YouTube, feel free to reach out uh, to us to uh, help us with some suggestions there on how to move forward. And um, let's take in, uh, so 
I'm going to take an elf in a moment, but uh, Laura, who just had to leave, asked, uh, I'm curious how you define trauma, uh, if she missed, missed your definitions. Yeah, so if you want to just maybe um, define trauma, redefine it. Sure, yeah. So this is another point. Um, I say trauma could also be a different word. Um, essentially, what I'm pointing to there are ways of making sense that get stuck in us as threats. You could also maybe just call it like threat mapping. <laughs> um, but it's like uh, trying to understand where these invisible, uh, the threats that have become invisible, so they're part of our sense making, but we no longer see them. And this is why I call it trauma, because it's not, it's not an actual threat that I'm perceiving in the situation, which I might be able to deal with, even with like an analyzing, um, okay, what is the appropriate response here? It's something that's part of my sense making and brings me out of the situation. Um, so in this, this is what I would be referring to when I talk about trauma. I'm not super committed to the word in a way, but that's what I mean when I say it. Uh, I mean, something that happened, usually it's uh, not, well, it's, uh, it's always not in your conscious mind. Um, it's often something that happened to you when you were much younger, could have been in relation to your parents or some other person. Uh, could have been in relation to just the culture and some kind of, or, or your social group, something that you absorbed that in some way I am helpless, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless. Uh, these kinds of like shame responses that get sort of ingrained in your nervous system. And this is what I'm referring to. So whatever, if you have a different word that you'd like to call that, I'm not committed to the word, but that's what I mean. <laughs> cool. Uh, Elf, uh, you're up next. Oh, yeah, I have to give you permission to unmute yourself. So, uh, Elf, you're up next. Sweet. Thanks for coming, Nathan. This is my first Doha session a few months after being in Monastic Academy, so it's kind of beautifully weird. Um, <laughs> but my question, I'm more, I want to like dig into the imaginal portion a bit. It seems like with the biomotive stuff, you're kind of processing the trauma. And then with the song and mantra, you're kind of reframing or reprogramming maybe, those are my words, but um, so I'm trying to get a sense of with the imaginal work, are you trying to process and heal the trauma or are you using it almost in positive imagery to like reframe it? And kind of the catalyst for this is, I think in Dan Brown's work with attachment theory, and this might be totally apples and oranges, attachment versus broader trauma. He really emphasizes the criticality of using the imaginal to create new maps and not getting bogged down and trying to rewire and rework all the old trauma or in his specific domain attachment. But so I guess in your broader space of all your clients and experiences, I'm just curious, how are you using that imaginal and versus reprogram and reframe versus, I guess, try to heal and process and fix everything couple yeah, questions sure. laced in there. Sure, yeah. <laughs> well, um, so what I'm trying to do is to both use the imaginal to get down to this, where is it? Like, uh, what is, like, um, if I try to think about what happened and why would I feel this way, I might not access that part of me where it's actually in my body. It's going to come up as an image. Maybe it's a, you know, maybe there's a, a a, a devil snake that's coming at me. Uh, maybe you know, what it could be kind of anything. <laughs> uh, but these images that come up can help me to access that part of my body where the where this is stored, this threat is stored because it's in that it's in that language that it will be most visible. And then I, I also use that language once we get to the the uh, the sort of release when it's come out. Um, then I also like to use these this more imagistic, sensorial way of approaching like what is that like so not to say like oh now you see what you thought before wasn't true but to say like oh now let's let's hold on to these images of peace of release of tranquility from which you could act grounded if you were to be able to be in that body state you wouldn't freak out when you're uh you know at the grocery store and the, the line is so long and you're you've, you're afraid of being five minutes late to your meeting uh something else is going on. But if you could hold on to that body state, you could actually, in that moment, you'd make decisions that would feel like expressions of yourself. So I try to use the imaginal in both going down into where this tension and threat is stored in the body 
and also in holding on to that sense of release. Um, yeah, to just bypass this analytical, which isn't very useful for that, um, and then use it in this way. Mm. Does that make sense? I don't it know does. Yeah. Addressed all your questions. <laughs> It sounds very uh, improvisational, but in a good way. Like, I'm, but that's what the vibe I'm getting. It kind of reminds yeah, me a little bit right. of family yeah. systems, where sometimes images come when you can't really get to certain emotions and other things. Yeah, uh, it's certainly. Um, I've done a lot of work with internal family systems, and um, the things that I listed there were sort of the main paradigms that I'm drawing on. But um, given a situation, it is still it's an experimental practice. Uh, and um, I'll sort of bring in whatever seems useful. Um, and it depends on the situation, also depends a lot on the person and how they're, how they feel into this situation, what seems to resonate with them the most. Um, yeah. That makes sense. I'll stop after this, but I guess one clear delineation, I guess, because it might've been unfair after hearing your answer, but a lot of the attachment work is pre 20 months. So it's pre memory and narrative and all that, which might be, kind of why Dan emphasizes that approach. And if you have a broader timeline of trauma that's more in the embodied and in the memory, then this different toolkit would be more appropriate. Yeah, well, and also though, like I have had experiences myself and other people where it definitely feels like and seems like we were in pre-verbal territory. Mm -hmm. So I don't aim for it necessarily. What I do is to try to just um, have you feel around and go through and find in your own sense of what, how much can I handle right now? Because <laughs> this can be like very like an intense emotional release. Um, and then sometimes, yeah, it goes, if someone can handle a lot, sometimes it even goes back to this. Uh, I am, I'm, I'm a baby. I'm, I, there are these sort of like really mythic uh, images coming out. Um, cool, thanks Nathan. Sure. All right, let's uh, end with Cheryl's question. Cheryl. Hi, um, I'm really fascinated by this, what feels like a channeling process of you receiving what that person, that the person that you're speaking with is, I guess, going through and then being able to then surface this mantra through music. So I'm just really curious about what is the experience like for you when that's happening? Oh man. Yeah, that's been a journey in itself um, because it is deeply connected. I don't um, just sit back and watch something. I'm like very much tuned in with my own, uh, with my nervous system with, as AJ was saying, sort of like connecting is, and holding that space and making it safe to be here together is an essential part of confronting that threat without uh, just shutting down. Um, so I've had to learn how to do that in a way that doesn't sit with me for the next four days, <laughs> um, where I'm, you know, like I'm not, like if I do this like, continuously, like, you know, everyone else maybe had an experience, did the trauma mapping, uh, and that was like this week and it was wild. And now you're sort of, and if I do it, you know, five times in the week, uh, I've got a lot of emotional energy. So I've had to develop for myself like uh, rituals in which I, after I'm done, I record the song, I, I send sort of a list of all of these images that came up and how and like where it was for you. So you can sort of like walk through it again and take it as an object um, of reflection. And then I close it off for myself and I, I let it go and release it as I send this email out uh, with the, with the song and with the, with the map. Um, but while I'm in the experience, it feels very much like uh, we're rolling through a dream together um, because it does take a lot of times this dreamlike quality comes about and I'm, I'm there with you. And um, I guess the closest thing I can describe is uh, experiences on like with psychedelics um, that you can really just feel like, whoa. <laughs> here we are and it's not we're not here we're we're here together but we're not in this room together we're somewhere uh together and we're just watching it come about come out and, come, and unfold in ways that like no one can predict and don't really have the usual kind of logical conversational 
uh, dynamic anymore. It's very intuitive. It's very unexpected, and um, there's a there's often a heaviness to the to the pain of it. And the, but but also, I, my job I see is my job to sort of like maintain that awareness that we're on a trip. <laughs> and 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 to keep that feeling of safety in myself like okay i know we're okay and and where we're going it, we're, i'm just walking with you through this forest and it may seem very scary but it's just dark um and as we emerge into the light which i know will come at some point um i've i've been down this road enough times and i can sort of like guide someone along um and they can just like flow and let it come so the experience for me is like intense uh, and rewarding and I'm learning to sort of go through it and release it. Um, uh, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm now actually like, we, I had a conversation with some friends about that before when, when Peter asked me if I would like to do this on the STOA, um, that am I far enough along in that practice to actually like handle doing this a lot? Um, and I think, and, and we decided like, yeah, it seems like it's a, it's possible now, but yeah, um, it's, it's definitely while we're there as intense for me emotionally, um, maybe, maybe not, let's not say that it's not as intense for me emotionally as it often is for the other people, but probably about 60, 70% as intense, like where I, I could do get quite emotionally activated in the process. Any uh, quick follow-up, Cheryl? So uh, we're approaching the top of the hour. Uh, so let's uh, close shortly. Uh, any kind of concluding thoughts, uh, Nathan, anything you'd like to leave us with? Oh, I'm just, uh, I'm really grateful for you guys and the work that you do. And I'm happy to be a part of this. I think that like the, the STOA is such an interesting and needed uh, confluence of all of these different practices and attempts to find what is it that's going to be useful and helpful uh, in confronting these sort of meta crises that we're facing. So uh, if I'm, I'm happy that like, I can be a part of it in whatever small way. Um, and uh, yeah, I really look forward to, to meeting people through this journey. Awesome, awesome. And uh, in a moment, I'll explain how to um, book Nathan in directly. Uh, I just want to take in uh, AJ. AJ, if you have any kind of thoughts that came alive that you'd like to leave us with. I'm just excited to do another session. <laughs> like how many sessions is one allowed to do with you, Nathan? Because I have a list of things where I'm like, this, this, and this could be, could be trauma map. So yeah, um, I'm really out. happy that as this many is as you want. <laughs> well. I'm happy to take another, as many rounds as you want, AJ. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so yeah, uh, the idea with the coaches in the residence, again, it's an experiment. We're doing it for um, another two months at least. Uh, and I, I, like, you know, we're gonna have uh, an embodiment advisor too. Uh, uh, Skylar Brown, who I had a session with, it was equally as profound as, as, as the session I had with Nathan. And so she's gonna be onboarded in, in May. But you know, the idea is like, we have all an expert in something, like, you know, some, someone needs something with shame, go to AJ or kind of like, flowing uh, verbally go to Tyson or trauma mapping go to Nathan or embodiment go to Skyler and so it's kind of like an ecology of coaches that are working together um, and for people who are watching on the um, YouTube channel Nathan will be added uh, to this uh, page uh, the stoa.ca slash coaches in the event description um, he'll be added to that page later today if you can book him directly in this link um, I think Nathan, you might have to edit this link because it says 15 minute like uh, uh, entry calls on the one that your calendar link. Uh, ah, but that, right. That's yeah. for uh, when Nathan updates that, you can use that link that I put in the chats for the people in the room right now. Um, and it's based off of a gift economy. Uh, we were talking when we originally set this, uh, if it was based on the marketing economy, it would probably be in the $100, $200 range, but people have been gifting um, outside of that range, which is fine. Uh, it's an experiment. Um, but be mindful that, you know, we do put a lot of love in this and this is an economy. There's a few people that didn't gift anything and then it's a little bit heartbreaking when that happens. But, you know, this is a part of the experiment and we might change things up uh, after more experimenting with it. So that being said, uh, feel free to 
book, AJ, Tyson, uh, Nathan, myself in. And yeah, can't wait for some trauma mapping to occur. Uh, Nathan, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And AJ, thanks for being my co-host today. Everyone, thanks for coming to Stoa. Listen to uh, my trauma mapping on the way out. Thank you. Thank you. You don't need.